You know, we've been talking about love for yourself. Joe started off last week, and I truly enjoyed last week's message, love for yourself. And, you know, I always have to kind of explain that one because when we talk about our church being for love, it starts with God loved us first, which is the reason that we have love at all. Then our response to that is that we love God. We love ourselves. We love each other as a body. And we love the people of the world. And uh, all of them are kind of self-explanatory except love yourself. Because a lot of people think, well, that's kind of narcissistic, kind of selfish. And, you know, you're not supposed to uh, be uh, talking about yourself so much. And I I want you to understand when we say love yourself, we're talking about the ability to see yourself the way God sees you and to think of yourself the way God thinks of you. We know we're supposed to love God. We know we're supposed to love others. In fact, Jesus even teaches us to love God and love others in a sacrificial way, putting them above our own selves, right? But that doesn't mean you don't love yourself. It's not a selfish kind of love, but it's really seeing yourself through the eyes of God, understanding who you are in Christ, and listen to this, living confidently as you I'm afraid there are a lot of Christians today who never learn to love themselves, never learn who they really are in Christ, and they never live confidently as themselves. Are you hearing me today? Let me tell you what the growth of self-love looks like. It looks kind of like this. You start out in life wishing you were someone else. You're like, you wish you could sing like Buddy. You wish you were as handsome as Harold. You wish you you had the money of Donald Trump. You wish something, right? You always wish that other guy uh, was you or that other girl was you, you know. Uh, But at some point as you grow, especially in the Lord, you start realizing, you know what? I've got some good qualities that contribute, right? And I kind of like myself. Um, And you do less beating up on you and envying others as time goes by until you finally reach a place where you say, I know who I am, what I bring to the table, and I love being me. I know I'm not Buddy. I know I'm not Harold. I know I'm not Donald Trump. I know I'm not these other people, but I don't need to be because I like being who God made me to be. When we talk about your loving yourself, that's what we're talking about, the ability to know that you are who God made you to be. It's not that you can't grow. It's not that you can't get better. We're all trying to do that. But that you really see who you are and you just love being you. You appreciate what you bring to the table. Come on. You know, when I was a kid, I loved Batman. I'm old enough to where we watched the TV show where it was just Batman and Robin. And they would get in a fight and you'd see the little thing that said kapow, right? And it was just no muscles, just an ordinary guy in a tight suit, and I loved Batman, uh, the show. Batman is a superhero that is uh, born out of evil and injustice and difficult situation and circumstances. And uh, he he started out as a kid. His parents were murdered, and he, as he grew up, he saw all of the evil, all of the injustice, and all of the, the wickedness around him, and he wanted to do something about it. So he reinvented himself, and and uh, he, he taught himself to fight, and he, because he's rich, he made all of these neat inventions he could use. And it, he, he went out into Gotham City, his world, and he made Gotham City a better place, a true superhero, right? And uh, the title of my message today is That Man, and uh, I want you to realize that uh, you're not Batman, but you can be that man or that woman if you're a lady here today. Of course, Batman, he's a fictional character, but there are real heroes in the world, real spiritual superheroes in the world. It has been this way for generations and generations. You could call these people, and I call them that man or that woman. These are the representatives of God who see evil and suffering in their world, and they're willing to step up and be a force for good. They're willing to be God's representative in their world. I want to help you today realize, understand what I'm talking about, how that you can be a real hero in your world, how that you can impact your circle of influence for Jesus Christ and how important it is today. So why do I call him that man? Well, because in every corner of life, God places an individual who will advance the kingdom, 
Fight the enemy. Help those in need. Stand up for those who are oppressed and downtrodden. Love the unloved and spread his message of hope. Your world, your family, your job, your school, your community needs someone like that. And the question is, will you be that man? Will you be that one who steps up and serves in that capacity? When I talk about that man, I'm, I want you to understand it in this way. Just let's get a picture from God's perspective of the earth and how he's looking at all of mankind. And, and there are a group of people who are lost and confused and stressed and hurt, oppressed or burdened. And in the middle of them, God places an individual that, that he uses to impact them for his glory and for their benefit. Are you hearing me today? So it could be like uh, God's looking down and there's this family and he sees how uh, lost they are, how they struggle, how they have turmoil and difficulties. And he puts one family member, maybe two, in the midst of that family. And they become the source of strength and hope for everyone else around them. Do you know what I'm talking about today? They become someone that others can rely on. It's not that they don't have problems. It's not that they're perfect. It's that they've chosen to step up, put the cape on, and let everybody else hang on them. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? I hope by the end of this, you'll get a clear picture of the kind of person I'm talking about, and you'll be inspired in your world to be that person. There is an intention that you have to have if you're going to be a hero in your world. God has called us to this. People begin to turn to this person for strength, for support, for guidance. And, you know, I remember years ago as I became, uh, started to get older and come into my ministry, people started depending on me a lot. And there are people today who don't even go to my church who think of me as pastor or as soon as they have a problem, they call on me. Some of my first reactions to that were this. They don't go to my church. Why, why do I have to deal with their problems? Why do they, you know, don't they go to their own church? And, you know, to be critical, to complain when people needed me until the Holy Spirit helped me realize what an honor it is to be the person in the group that is the hero, to be the person that God uses in the midst of a group of people that you're the one that God uses to help them. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? What a privilege and honor it is when they call on you. It's not an inconvenience, it's an opportunity. Hallelujah. It is what God has called me to be. And so I realize today that God has placed Kathy and I in a position where we are in the midst of our world, someone that they can rely on. They can turn to us when they're lost. They can turn to us for strength, for support, for guidance, for help. When they get in trouble, when they're spiritually destitute, when they have a need, a, a difficulty, a challenge, they call upon us. And we don't say, you know what? You don't go to my church. Don't call me. We say we'll be glad to do what we can to help you because that's what God called us to do are you with me today I want you to realize that you can be a hero in your world you've been called you've been given power to affect change in your circle of influence but you got to be willing to accept the call you must be willing to say I'll be that man I'll be that woman in my family I'll be that man in my job in my school I'll be that woman in my community I'll be that person that is strong for the Lord that other people can rely on hallelujah Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. We know that God has called his children. The call is to go, right? When you're lost, the call is to come, come to me. And then when you're saved, you're saved for the purpose of good works. And the call is then, hey, get this power called the Holy Spirit and go. And go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples, heal the sick, do miraculous things. Go. You have been called. The idea that it's only the pastor who's been called is wrong. You have been called. Let me tell you why. I don't live in your world. I don't live in your Gotham City. I don't live in your sphere of influence. I don't have your family, your job, your community, your neighborhood. You have a world that's your world that you can reach. God has placed you there. Oh, you think you're there by accident, but I'm here to tell you God's got a plan and you're part of it. Amen. He put you there for a reason. You have been called. Number two, you've been given power. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What's the power for? Is it so you can get whatever you want whenever you want it? No. 
The power is for this. The power is so that you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even the remotest parts of earth. Now, that sounds like a, a far off kind of thing. Did God call me to be a missionary uh, and, and go over to another country or something like that? Those kind of thoughts go through people's mind. And I like one guy who felt led that the Lord had called him to be a missionary to Hawaii. That sounds like a good gig. <laughs> It's not a bad gig, right? Um, the truth is you are a missionary to your world. Where is your Jerusalem? Where is your Samaria? Where is your uttermost parts of your world? It could be your neighbors. It could be the group that you gather with, the social club that you're in. It could be the people who you know on Facebook or online. Wherever your influence goes, that is your world. That's what you're trying to reach, your world. And you've been given power by the baptism of the Holy Spirit to do what God called you to do. Can I tell you, without the Spirit, you can't do what God called you to do. But with the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, we can do whatever God called us to do if we have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You've been called. You've been given power. So the question is, are you willing? Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm so grateful for men and women of God who are the ones who said, here am I, Lord, send me. Because I, I want you to know that not every Christian is willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me. Not every Christian is willing to put on the cape, to go into their world and be a hero, to be a source of strength and hope to the people around them. Not everyone is willing to do that because there's a sacrifice involved in it. And a lot of people's faith in God is based upon what God can do for them and not so much about what they can do for God. Come on, I'm getting real with you today, huh? But thank God for the ones who say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I will go. I will proclaim your word. I will bear up those who are hurting. I will testify to the truth. I will stand up for you in the midst of the world you put me in. I'll be that man. I'll be that woman. Every born-again, spirit-filled believer can be that man or that woman. But you must be willing to say, I'll go. Send me. What makes a Christian go from being just another member of the crowd to being a that man or a that woman? It's his willingness to say yes to God. I'll be the one, Lord. I'll sacrifice myself and put others first. I'll obey you when you tell me to go. It's going to cost you some of your money. It's going to cost you some of your time. While other people are doing things, you're not going to get to do them because you spent your money helping people and you spent your time helping people. Because you don't live just to consume for yourself, but you find it a joy and an honor to serve the Lord and be his hero in your world. Are you with me today? So what does that man do? He, number one, advances the kingdom. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Jesus came into the world and he said, I bring the kingdom with me. The kingdom of God is coming. In fact, he said, it's here right now. It's a spiritual kingdom right now, but he's coming back again and to make it a physical kingdom. Amen. But the kingdom of God is as real as a hand in front of your face. And what is the kingdom of God anyway? It's the society of people who live in under the protection and in the service of King Jesus. Hallelujah. The king is Jesus. When we say that man advances the kingdom, what we mean is that we promote the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the Republicans, not the kingdom of the Democrats, not the kingdom of white people or black people, not the kingdom of the poor or the rich. We promote the kingdom of God. Amen. God is our number one. He is the reason we're doing this. What does that man do? He fights the enemy. Luke 10, 19, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. God has given us power over the enemy. You know how silly we look from heaven's perspective when we see a brother who's being oppressed by the enemy, a sister who's being oppressed by the enemy, and we sit there and go, man, that's awful what they're going through. When this scripture says you've been given power over all the power of the enemy, amen? God placed you there not to spectate and commentate on what's going on. He placed you there to do something about it. The devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. God's children are supposed to go around finding the devil and whipping him, amen? 
Hallelujah. You ought to be the kind of person who doesn't just look for a fight with the devil, but you're ready for a fight with the devil. Amen. Glory to his name. What does that man do? He helps those in needs. Let me, let me read a little passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You know what? This is a mark of the children of God, is that when people are hungry, we feed them. When, when people are sick, we visit them. We pray for them. When people need help, we help them. When people are all discouraged, we step up and we do things for them. You know, have you ever had a, 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 a waitress and you go to a restaurant and you need something and you, and you kind of wave one of them down and they go, sorry, not my table. Christians are not the sorry, not my table kind of people. Sorry, you're not one of my friends. Sorry, you're not one of my close ones. Sorry, you don't go to my church. You're not in my group, so someone else can mess with you. No, Christians are the kind of people who see a need, and if we can, we help. We can't always solve every problem. We're not Jesus, hallelujah. But we can do some things, amen. We help those who are in need. When they're poor, we help them. When they're going through a difficulty, we, we stand by them. We pray for them. We lift them up. We encourage them. We're there for those who are going through a difficult time. It doesn't do any good to tell people about Jesus if when they go through a problem, you're unwilling to treat them like Jesus would. Amen. Hallelujah. Number four, what does the, that man do? He stands up for the downtrodden and the oppressed. Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. You know what? There's a little guy in every world. There are the people who are going through it, who had a difficult time. You know, the Holy Spirit helped me realize long ago that when you look at other people who maybe are making bad choices in their life, or they can't keep a job, or they're, they're, they have problems with substance abuse or something like that, it's not fair to judge them from your perspective, uh, especially me. I'll talk about me because I grew up in a good home with good parents who taught me well. We went to the house of God, and for a long time, even if I didn't serve God, the word of God was being pounded into my head until I got saved. Are you with me today? It's not fair to me to look at someone else who maybe only had one parent or maybe grew up with parents who were abusive or, or who did bad things. It's not fair for me to look at another person who went through a different situation and judge them because they don't act like I do. Amen? It's better to have uh, some compassion for the downtrodden, for those who are going through it. And let me tell you, there are some people who had the perfect parents, the perfect upbringing, and God is in their life, and yet they still have challenges and are oppressed, have difficulties, and they're going through it. And you know what? God wants us to be the kind of people who help those who have gone through difficulties, who are going through challenges, who are being oppressed, who don't have justice being done. You know, Pastor Buddy and I were just talking this morning about how uh, you can't trust the government. Uh, there, there's no justice. There, there, there's proof that the government lies, cheats, steals, and there's no one to hold them accountable anymore. And I remember, you know, being younger, you always thought when somebody got caught that the, the higher-ups, the law, somebody would call them into account. There'd be heads would roll at the end of the day. But we're getting to a point where you, all the people at the top are just as guilty as anyone else, right? And, you know, the only answer for justice is the trumpet's going to sound and Jesus is coming back, hallelujah, and he's going to tell the truth. Come on. There's a lot of injustice in the world today. Can I promise you something? God can make the justice right in other people's lives. But he might require you to stand up and do something about it. To speak up. To help out. Come on. Stand up for those who are being oppressed. That man also loves the unloved. 
There are a lot of people that just don't have love in their life. And they don't even know how much it will change them just to have someone care about them. I think it's a sad thing that Christians, we wall ourselves off from the lost. Sometimes it's in an effort to protect God from their stink or their sin. Like those people are so bad, if I get around them, uh, people are going to think poorly of my testimony. But let me tell you something. If religious people ever criticize you because you hang out with sinners, then you're in the same shoes that Jesus wore. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Love the unloved. Jesus said, this is the second commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let me tell you about our neighbor to the left. He's, a, he's, a, he's about my age, maybe a little younger than me. And... Uh, He's, he's, uh, he's one of those people that just is a little bit rough around the edges. Now, once you get to talk to him, he's, he's just like a normal guy. But I'll just describe him this way. When, you know when you go on the Internet to, to hook up to Wi-Fi and you can see all your other neighbors' Internet names, Wi-Fi names? Uh, there's one called the White House and another one is ATT, something like that. Well, his Wi-Fi is called the Mad Mexican. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> That kind of is a great, he knows himself very well because he just appears to be mad all the time. And sometimes he's hard to love. Can I tell you something? Jesus said, if you love the people who love you, you're no better than the lost. In fact, he said, I want you to love so much that you love your enemies. You love those who hurt you and persecute you. Come on. Now, your enemies aren't driving nails in your hands and feet. They might be driving some in your heart or in your mind, but God has called us to love them. Why? Because love changes things. First Peter says this, love covers a multitude of sins. What does that mean? Well, when Jesus came in love, he certainly covered a multitude of sins. But it also means that as we love others, as we share love to other people, God begins to get into their lives. Amen. And he begins to transform and change them. No one can truly be loved and not be changed by it. Come on. God will accept you as you are, but he won't leave you as you are. Because when God loves you, it changes you. Hallelujah. And we are the representatives of God. Number six, if you're that man, what you do is you tell the message you share the story. Sometimes we share the gospel without words, but sometimes we need to use words. Amen? Because people have the wrong idea about Christianity. Many people think Christianity is us trying to be better people, just trying to be good people. It's this, it's this good to better salvation thing where, like, everyone is a good person, but if we become Christians, Christ's teaching will help us be better people. That's not Christianity. Christianity is all of you are lost, that your sin is deserving of eternal separation from God, and you can't save yourself, so you better cry out for a Savior because God is the only one who can save you, and he sent his son Jesus to die for you, shed his blood in your place so you wouldn't have to, and if you trust in that, if you put your faith in that, if you repent and turn to that, you will be saved. That's what Christianity is, amen? Somebody needs to say that. Somebody needs to tell people this is the story of Jesus. When he says go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation, what he means is you need to tell people what the gospel is. The gospel is that we are lost and we need a savior. The gospel is that Jesus came and died for us and rose from the dead for us. The gospel is that if we place our faith in him, we shall be saved. Come on. Who's going to tell them? You know, there was a time for decades where you could just invite lost people to church and let the pastor tell them through the sermon. But I don't know if you've noticed or not, but those days are over. People don't visit churches anymore. Even Christians don't come to church on a regular basis anymore. But certainly the lost aren't coming to church to hear a sermon. It's going to have to come from you. You're going to have to tell the story of the gospel in your world. And listen, God will help you. God will help you if you just step out in faith and begin to do that. You know, Batman has special weapons and special powers, and so do we. If you're that man in your world, you're not just another person. God's given you superpowers. Come on. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God, there are powers at work in your life. You carry the living God within your life. Amen. 
If God lives within you, let, now let's follow the logic here. Is the Holy Spirit God? Yeah, he's not part of God. He's not God without the healing, without the resurrection, without the power. He's God, right? And does the Holy Spirit live in you? And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, does he come upon you? Amen. So if you've got the spirit in you and upon you, you've got superpowers. That's why Jesus said to the church in Acts chapter 1, go wait in Jerusalem. This power is going to come upon you. And what happened? It fell upon them and they began to speak in tongues. Not only that, speaking in tongues isn't the, the biggest part. The biggest part is that they began to disperse and go into their world and begin to do what God called them to do. Amen. God has given us weapons. Prayer is a weapon. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins one to the other. Pray for one another so that you may be healed because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Praise God. I said this last week, I think. We pray because we believe prayer changes things. Amen. We believe it so much that we know that if we don't pray, things aren't as good as they could be. Amen. Come on. There are situations now that you may look at in your life and realize they're not what they should be or what you want them to be, and you can trace it back to the fact that you or no one else prayed about it. I'm in your kitchen now, ain't I? What are the weapons? The Word of God is a weapon. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. You know what? The Word of God is the truth, right? It is the truth. It is the truth. In a world full of lies, the Word of God is the truth. And you know what the Word of God does? It cuts the lies up. Because Satan is the father of lies. The way, he, the way he goes after people is through lies. You know what? The devil can't really touch you, but he can lie to you and get you to do something, believe something you shouldn't believe. But the Word of God is the truth. You know, I tell people sometimes, if, you know, if you, if you wonder if you're saved, because maybe you don't feel like it at times, uh, feeling isn't the way you know whether you're saved. It's by the Word of God. Did you line up with the Word of God? Because if you did line up with the Word of God, then you're saved. And you know it not because you feel it. You know it because the Bible says it. Why? Because the Bible is truth. And it cuts through all of the emotions, all of the ups and downs, all of the deceptions, all of the lies. When you have the word of God, what you have is a weapon to cut through the lies to tell people the truth. Come on. What are the weapons? Love is a weapon. We talked about this already. Love covers a multitude of sins. When we love others, it's a weapon against evil. It is a weapon against evil. Truth is a weapon. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Truth is a weapon. When we speak the word of God, when we speak the truth, it is a weapon in a world full of lies. What are some of the weapons? Good deeds are a weapon for the Lord. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Are you hearing that today? What does he say? Let your light shine, that's you, and the light within you is shining, so that people can see it. And what are they seeing? They're seeing your good works. A lot of people are afraid of that. You know, I have, I have some people sometimes uh, comment that, you know, the Bible says you, you shouldn't let anyone see your good works Shouldn't let anyone, you know, your right hand shouldn't know what your left hand is doing. And if you're doing it to be seen of men, uh, then God doesn't honor that. And all you get is the glory of men. All of that is true. But at the same time, Jesus said, do good works in such a way that people can see them and give glory to your father. So what is the truth about that? The truth is simply this. What is your motivation? If you're doing good works to get pats on the back, then that's what you're getting, pats on the back. But if you're doing good works because you love people and you love God, then that is a testimony. It's a weapon. It shows people God. You know what happens when you do good works in an honest and real way? People look at that and they consider maybe this God thing is true. And then the spark comes on and the Holy Spirit comes in and conviction begins to happen and the light comes on. And this is how people come into the kingdom of God because you took a neighbor a meal when they were sick. Come on. 
When you said something positive to a co-worker that was going uh, in a negative direction, come on. And God uses these good works to bring glory to your Father who is in heaven. You and I are not a powerless people. We're not just another one of the folks in our little circle of influence. We've been given power. God has placed us there intentionally so that we can be a light in a dark world. Come on, somebody. Jesus is the original that man. Amen? Amen. The superhero of all superheroes. I like the little memes that you see, uh, and it's got Jesus, and he's kind of sitting down and reaching out to people, and around him on their knees is Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and all these other, like, sub-superheroes, right? It's, uh, that's kind of a nice thought that no matter how high we get in life, Jesus is the only one. He's the one, the superhero. He is the original, that man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That if we would just believe in him, we might have everlasting life. God looked down and saw us lost, broken, destitute, mankind without any hope to save ourselves. He could have just let us burn and created a new world, but he loved us. And so he sent Jesus, and Jesus was willing to go and give his very life. That's what love is. There is no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for others. Some of you may say, I'm not Jesus, though. You're right. You're not Jesus. But let me, let me tell you this. You are the body of Christ. It works like this. When Jesus came to earth, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He came up out of the water. The Spirit descended upon him. And immediately after that happened, he, he left and began his ministry. Soon after, he walked into the temple and he opened up the scroll in Isaiah and he read the words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel on and on. You know how that went, right? And then he went out and was tempted by the devil, overcame the temptation of the devil, and began his earthly ministry, began preaching the kingdom of heaven and the preaching of the kingdom of God. And in that time, the, 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 the ministry of Jesus was centered in the physical body and location of Jesus. But he said to, this, to his disciples, I'm going to go away, but don't be discouraged because I'm going to send someone to live in you. And that someone is the Holy Spirit, and he's going to guide you into all truth. So Jesus ascends to the Father, right? He sends the Holy Spirit, and it comes inside the church. And then what does the church do? The church goes out, and Paul described it this way. Now you are the body of Christ. Before that happened, Jesus' physical body was the physical vessel through which his ministry worked. Now you and I are the body of Christ. In other words, we are the physical vessels that God uses to do the ministry of Jesus in the world today. Come on, somebody. That's why you got to know who you are in Christ. Yeah, I know you don't deserve it, but grace extends not just to your salvation, but to your life, to your calling, to your ministry. God has called you, put the spirit in you so that you could continue the ministry of Jesus. Yes, it's his work. Yes, it's what he's doing in our life. Yes, it's he's the one who's going to heal. He's the one who's going to deliver. He's the one who's going to save. But it's my body. It's my mouth. It's my hands that are going to go if I'm willing to be that one. But I've got to be the one who's willing. Matthew 9 35 through 38, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. In this little passage of scripture, we see, number one, that Jesus is that man. What does he do? He looks out and sees the people lost, hurting, suffering, and he has compassion for them. They're like a sheep with no shepherd wandering around in turmoil. So he sees them. And what does he do? It says he goes to their cities and villages, and he teaches them, and he heals diseases and every kind of sickness. He delivers them. He went about doing good, all kinds of wonderful things. But not only do we see in the scripture that Jesus is that man in his world, in the world, but he's calling others to be that man or that woman in their world. He says, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There are a lot of dark places that need one person to be the light in the middle of them. And I don't have enough people who are willing to do that. 
That's why he says, pray for the Lord of the harvest. I want to challenge you today because it could be that your family is going through more than they should be going through because you are sitting back as if you're one of them. Instead of stepping up, putting on the cape and saying, I'm going to be God's representative in this mess. It could be that in your job, you've been praying that God would take you out of it because your boss is mean and there's a lot of problems and challenges and, and you wish that God would just surround you with a comfortable employment, but God has placed you there so that you can be peace in the midst of a stormful place. You've been praying that God would take you out, but he put you in there for a purpose if you're willing to step up and be that man. If you're willing to step up and be that woman, can you see the need around you today? Do you look at your Gotham City? I'm going to talk more about this in the future because I think this is really important. Where is your Gotham City? What is your world? Who do you influence today? Your family, your coworkers, your neighbors. The people you know online, I got people online who follow what I say very carefully that I've never met in life and who live in another state. And you know what? I love that. That's a part of my circle of influence. And I try to post stuff that influences them for Jesus. Are you hearing me today? But if you don't identify your Gotham City, you won't know that God has called you to do something about it. You've got to identify your world. And then the question is, when you look at your family, your coworkers, your school, do you care? Do you care about your neighbors and what they're going through? Does it matter to you? Do you look around you and see the need? And number two, do you know who you are in Christ? Have you finally come to the place where you realize, I know I'm not perfect, and I know I can't preach like Pastor Avi or sing like Buddy, and I'm not, I'm not whatever, I'm not engaging, I'm not these things, but I am these things. I have this talent and this gifting, and I can, I can bake like no one else, and when I take food to people who've been going through a challenge, it's good. It would be bad if Mylon baked things for people and took it to them. It'd be like a second punishment, right? But, but if Kathy bakes things and takes it to them, it's a good thing, right? And if I can get to it first, they might not even get it. That's how good it is. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know that God has called you, empowered you, given you special gifts to use for your world, for his glory, that the real work of ministry doesn't happen in here. It happens when you go out into your Gotham City and into your world. And finally today, are you willing to step up and be that man, to be that woman? Are you willing to say, you know what, Lord, I'll be the one. I'm not perfect, and I'm not always going to do right, and I'm going to have problems of my own, but I'm going to help people. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to listen to the voice of the Lord. I'm going to step up and be an example as the best I can. Sometimes, listen, Christian, sometimes the example that you need to put out is how to be a Christian who makes mistakes and then repents and asks forgiveness for their mistakes. Now, they don't need to see a Christian who never makes a mistake. They need to see a Christian make a mistake, know that Christians are human, and then know how to say, it was my fault, I'm sorry. Not give an excuse for why they did something wrong and it's everybody else's problem. Are you with me today? Will you step up in the midst of your world and be that person? Finally today, then, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Send me. As I look out here today, I can see some. I could call your names out, but you are the rock in your circle of influence. You are that foundational person that represents Christ in your family and in your world. Uh, sometimes, you know, I go to see my mom and dad twice a week, and they have been these kind of people, these kind of heroes in their world for a long time, not just in their church they pastored, but in their life. And to this day, there are people who call them when they have a problem to ask for prayer, to ask for help, and they're always willing to do that. And, and I'll just brag on them for a moment, and I could brag on some of you other ones too, uh, how God has used you to be a person of influence in your world, how you've put God first. You let other people hang on you. Sometimes it's like other people just are hanging on you all the time. They, they need you so much. And, and it, in the flesh, that can get to be challenging. But in the spirit, you realize it's because God has honored you with a position in your world to help others who are in need. Come on. Will you step up? Will you be that person? Maybe you're on the edge and the brink of it. I want to push you over the edge. I want to convince you today that you're mature enough, you're spiritual enough. You can be the person that others go to when they're going through a challenge. You can be the one that your neighbors rely on as a source of strength, peace, and hope in your world. 
You can represent God. You've been called. You've been empowered for that purpose.